Infer is a tool that tries to find bugs in computer code. And it does this, it's called a static program analyzer. It does this without running the program. So it takes the program in as input, then it examines the program, and it tries to reason about the program in something like how a human would do it. And as it's doing this, it makes guesses about the program. And sometimes the guesses are, oh, there will be a bug. There will be a null pointer crash. There will be a race condition amongst concurrent threads, things like this. So once it finds potential bugs, it tells the Facebook developers and they get to act upon them. Also, it's an open source tool, so it's um, used by other companies. Try to find um, as many bugs as we can to prevent them from getting into production. We've done one or two videos on Turing, on undecidability, on yeah. all these sorts of issues with paradox, etc. Has this been done with machine learning or something? Can you talk to me about that? It's done with um, some techniques in the older kind of AI called symbolic AI. And so our tools have two techniques in them um, that are AI related. One is called the frame problem, which is about describing what the, what the program can do without listing all of the myriad of things that it can't do. And then the other problem is called abductive inference, which is something from the philosophy of science by the philosopher Charles Pierce. This is about making hypotheses. Usually it's about making scientific hypotheses, but our tools make guesses about the computer program. The guess might be, this bit of code needs an acyclic linked list in order to run without producing a crash. So we, our tool would look at the code and make that guess and then try to confirm that guess. So it's, so this is how a human might do it. A human might look at a code, see a while loop and then hypothesize, oh, I betcha this needs an acyclic linked list or a cyclic linked list. And so the tool tries to make these kinds of guesses and it does it using symbolic logic, using a form of symbolic logic called separation logic. And it makes the guesses, then it tries to confirm the guesses. As I understand it, the, the, the key to what Turing said was that it was in general you couldn't do this. So Turing showed that in general, a certain problem, the halting problem, can't be solved by computer algorithms. And it follows that many other problems, something called Rice's theorem, it follows that many other problems can't be solved by an algorithm. But can be solved means for all input programs, can we answer in a perfect yes, no way whether, say, the program might crash the program has a race condition. The program has a security violation. So there's two parameters here, for all input programs and perfect yes, no. So if you relax the for all input programs and look at a smaller collection of programs, then there's something you can do. And then the other way you can play is you can relax the perfect yes, no answers. And so our tools do both of those. So we're concentrating on the programs that humans write at Facebook which is a small, small, small subset of all programs. So we don't have to work for all input programs. And then the other thing that we do is the perfect yes, no answers are still very difficult. So there's something about computability theory which says when you've got an undecidable problem, you need to approximate it. So you can get bigger and bigger subsets of the undecidable problem or bigger and bigger subsets of the, of the no part of the undecidable problem, but you'll never get the perfect answer. So you have to approximate. And so this is an interesting thing about this is this, this means you know that you'll never be finished. You'll never find the algorithm to do the perfect yes, no answers. But what we do is we train our, our techniques on the Facebook code bases, and then we listen to what the programmers say and to what production crashes say to try to make these approximations better. So we, we are working on formally undecidable problems, but we're trying to approximate them and they're, we're using what the Facebook engineers and what the production statistics tell us. They guide us towards good approximations. So that's what's quite fascinating to me. When I was an academic before, and I thought, oh, um, undecidable problems. This is a showstopper. You shouldn't try to answer these problems. But as soon as you get in the game and you realize, oh, what I need to do is approximate, then you're in a better position. There's a whole computer science theory called abstract interpretation about this approximation. This is a bit like kind of the computer version of you can't please all of the people all of the time, right? Well, yeah, especially, I mean, it, it's all of the people. We would like to be able to, because again, um, all of the people aren't, still aren't gonna write those infinitely many programs, right? But we, it's, it's impossible at the moment to make one of these tools to tackle an undecidable problem that 
works for all input code bases in the world. Um, it, it, it's not possible. But what we've found is that we can train them for certain specific kinds of code bases. And a good place to do this is in industry. Like Facebook has various code bases, very big, um, hundreds of millions of lines of code. But there is some regularity to that code. And there are design principles that the, the engineers use. So we try to get to know the mind of the engineers, get to know the mind of the programmers. And we can just know that by feedback from them. We don't just dream up what it is. And we tailor our algorithms to that. And then we start getting good results. But if we tried to just apply it to all random code in the world, then we don't get good results. And I think that's true in general for the area. You've got these titans of computer science, as you mentioned, you know, Turing and various other people kind of working on this problem. Where do you come in? I come in in the early 2000s. I was part of a, I had a research team and, and I was um, working on a theory called separation logic, which I developed with my colleague, Professor John Reynolds from Carnegie Mellon. Um, this built on another, another of the things that Turing did. So Turing did all of the bit about undecidability, but he also founded the area of program verification. He wrote a paper in, I think, 1949 called Checking a Large Routine. For him, large was a few tens of lines of code. He showed how the human could write little logical statements around various parts of the code and then confirm that the code did the right thing. We made a theory to try to do similar sorts of stuff for more modern software with the pointers and the objects and things that one finds in modern software. And this worked very, very well for proving programs by hand, like Turing was doing. We scaled his techniques so we could do better. And then I had um, some, a graduate student, Cristiano Calcagna, who said, maybe we can convert this into a tool that tries to do the same thing. And then Cristiano and a number of other people joined me and we did years of research. And then him and another fellow, De Stefano, they decided, let's make a startup company and try to make this real. And Facebook bought the startup company in 2013, a company called Monoidix. And then presto, I ended up at Facebook. So I started from proving programs by hand, like Turing was doing. This is like, take this infinite collection of input programs, let's make it one program, right? Now we can get a perfect yes, no answer, but the human has to guide it. Then we made very efficient techniques for the human to do the proof using separation logic. Then we said, let's make the computer mimic what we're doing in our hand proofs. And so we did that. And oddly enough, it all worked out. And I never, never, never expected to be able to run these algorithms on tens of millions of lines of code. Never. But there are some technical reasons why it worked, but we made it there. So I didn't plan to apply these techniques to tens of millions of lines of code. But it happened. <laughs> We've done a number of videos on things like uh, functional programming. And I know there's a lot of talk about um, using functional programs to prove certain things to do yeah. with programs. Will this work on any kind of, say, programming language and things? Or are you set on whatever code base Facebook is using? See, it, it works on any kind of programming language. And there is a, a school of thought which says we need to change the programming language to make it easier to verify. But I come from the different point of view. I say. There's billions of lines of code out there. And instead of rewriting the world, why, mathematical logic is very powerful. Why don't we try to deal with that code as is? And this theory separation logic, when we discovered it, we were shocked because we were able to give nice mathematical pretty proofs for not only C programs, but assembly language programs. And this was a shock because my prejudice at the time and my co-author John Reynolds's prejudice was thou shalt use functional programming languages or, or lovely things like that. But then I found that certain very dirty algorithms had beautiful proofs. Like there's a, a, an algorithm for coding doubly linked lists where instead of having, having forward and back pointers, use the XOR of them in order to um, use less memory. And this is, it, it's a funny program, but one day John Reynolds said to me, Peter, tell me the dirtiest program you know. I told him this program, and then the next morning, he came into the office and said, it's not a dirty program anymore, here's the proof. This was really a shock and an eye-opener, and so as a result, I, I feel like, yes, programming languages are important, and programming language design is so important, but using mathematical logic, there's no reason why we can't attack all of the code. If a programmer wants to dispose all of the nodes in a tree, to delete them, they can write a recursive procedure 
that works like this. If I, if I... You mentioned it's open source. We have a lot of coders who watch the, the videos here. If somebody wants to go and have a look at it or have a try of it or play of it, how, how do they go about that? Where would they go? Yeah, there's, they can go to our website called, it's fbinfer.com. They can go to our website, but um, once they're there, they can download Infer from GitHub. Um, they can run it on their own code. They can search for integrations with whatever build system they may, might be using. We use a build system called Buck. Um, there's another build system called Gradle, which people use. There's various build systems. So they can do that. They can get community support and maybe ask a few questions. Is the next step for it to then start fixing the code for them? That's very interesting. So um, that's a dream. And there is a, a, a project at Facebook, not by my team, but by another team, which you, does automatically fix some of Infer's warnings, simpler ones, no pointer exceptions. Um, now that, that's that's pretty remarkable. Um, it doesn't automatically fix. It automatically suggests it suggests a fix, but we're letting the human decide. So the humans are the final. They have the final say whether to accept that fix or not. Um, so that's really exciting. But I don't try to. I don't tend to think that the robots are going to fix all of our code for us, because for any given bug, often there's more than there's no unique cause. And there's no unique fix. And at this moment, and for the foreseeable future, human judgment is needed, especially on the more subtle ones, to know which of the fixes is, is the right one. And right, I think a, a, a reasonable approach is to have a tool suggest several fixes, and then the humans to decide. But I'm not in the camp of thinking that the, the bots are going to give us the right fixes. I don't think it's really possible in the foreseeable future. Development is a process. Have you had anything where it's gone wrong at all? Have you had problems with it at all? Now we're in the realm of software engineering. We're not in the realm of mathematical logic. So it's, it can't be perfect. It can't be perfect. Um, here's one example. One example. Oh, so we have false positives where we give wrong answers, but there are more comical things that we've gone wrong. One time, um, Infer ran wild and and it spammed one of the developers. So it found a potential error or what it thought was a potential error. And instead of re reporting it once, it reported it 60 times. And luckily the developer it did it to didn't get upset. He just laughed. And he sent us a message saying, is, is Infer gone a little bit insane today? There's a very interesting slogan at Facebook called move fast and break things. It was an old slogan. If we were to break things with the infer tool, so say we spammed the developer by giving them 60 copies of the same bug report, which um, might not be the best thing if we did this to all the developers. So if we make a mistake and it's an honest mistake, and then we move fast to resolve it, to help the people, then it's good. Um, so I gave you a, a comical instance of, of where infer went wrong, but um, on any given day, Infer will make bug report suggestions which are not true, and it will miss potential bugs too. And this is all related to the undecidability, right? To the undecidability of the problems we're working on, the, the undecidability in the sense of Turing and Gerdo. Um, you're going to run into these problems if you've got an undecidable, if you're working on undecidable things. So, yeah, as another, another way to say it is because it's, it's imperfect because of undecidability, but it also means will never be finished. So our job will never be finished. It's like a job for life, <laughs> working on an undecidable problem. And we're contributing some funds to help support Bletchley Park. There's the link to Turing, which is um, one of my intellectual heroes, but also um, Bletchley Park historically was important in computing and in society for the role that it played in, in the Second World War. A parallel way of removing all the nodes in the tree